in this lesson, what we're going to do is carry on talking about the different principles that pertain to the British Constitution. Previously, we've looked at the idea of the rule of law. We've looked at the idea of a separation of powers between the various branches of government. This lesson is going to look at what I would personally argue as one of the most important, at least one of the most consequential principles of the UK Constitution, which is this idea of parliamentary sovereignty, the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. So I argue it's one of the most important principles. Essentially, one of the reasons why is because it essentially causes the rest of the principles to fall in place in regard to how the uncodified nature of our constitution actually works and actually is formulated. And so as a result of that, it actually provides for a significant method by which the other principles interact with each other and interact with this principle specifically. And it seems to be the case that you can construct our understanding of the constitution around the idea that parliament is sovereign in terms of the lawmaking authority that it has. And it doesn't even necessarily make sense to suggest that we can remove or, or overcome parliamentary sovereignty within our system. And we'll get to the reasons why, and we'll talk about some of the argued attempts, quote unquote, at uh, overthrowing or overturning this idea of parliamentary sovereignty. And I'll explain why each of them fail uh, quite significantly and uh, would be arguments against the principle um, that parliamentary sovereignty has been eroded. So, a simple, uh, essentially, sorry, the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty provides what is arguably the most fundamental legal premise of the UK Constitution. The doctrine means that an act of parliament must be obeyed by the courts, and that later acts prevail over earlier ones, and that rules made by external bodies cannot override acts of parliament. In a more pithy, simple way of explaining it, Parliament is the supreme lawmaking authority within the United Kingdom. It has the ability to make and unmake any primary legislation it so chooses. It does not follow that Parliament is the supreme political institution that exists in terms of its ability to have political sovereignty. We will draw the line and make a delineation between what is described by A.B. Dicey as the distinction between the legal and the political. Uh, in terms of law, in terms of legality, in terms of lawmaking, Parliament has supreme authority over any other institution in terms of creating primary legislation. But in terms of politically, then we would argue, and it would be correct to argue, that the power that exists rests in the hands of the people through the democratic mandate of the election process. I'll explain why in a second. But let's first talk about the foundations of parliamentary sovereignty. It rests on relatively frail and uh, precedential foundations, because without a codified constitution, it is impossible to be sure that to its legal basis, rather than the fact that it was actually just an evolving practice from the 1688 Glorious Revolution. So it, because we don't have this entrenched idea of a codified constitution, it doesn't make sense to suggest that it has a very clear delineated point of legal basis, because even the 1688 Glorious Revolution is a reaction to the revolutions of the earlier 1600s, the, the civil war that overthrew Charles I, the execution of the king, the, uh, the, the regicide that was committed. And even that can be traced even further back to the Acts of Union and the, well, at least the, the union of the monarchy between, uh, between Scotland and England, with James I taking the crown in 1603. So... The Glorious Revolution is significant in the fact that it, it specifies a specific point at which we would argue that parliamentary sovereignty gains its legal foundation. But even from there, there are arguments to suggest that the, the whispers of parliamentary sovereignty, if you will, the conversation about parliamentary sovereignty and the growth of Parliament's influence over the lawmaking process dates back even further to then. It's possible to maintain as well that the common law has a supreme uh, authority in terms of lawmaking, but this would be incorrect given the fact that um, the, it would that would be a violation of parliamentary sovereignty just because the common law is an older institution, arguably, 
um, it is indeed definitely older than the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. It does not therefore mean that statutory law is something that is subordinate to that of the courts, although the courts interpret statute law. We have, it, there's a lot of things that have to be unraveled in this regard. The question of ultimate source of power cannot be answered within the legal system necessarily um, because it depends on a public acceptance of this power. But this is relating more to the political theory of, of power and where power actually resides. Because like I've said, uh, political sovereignty 100% rests within the, uh, within the hands of the, the democratic electorate. But legal sovereignty rests within Parliament by way of the consent from the people. And so you have to think about that as well. But let's understand parliamentary sovereignty in a bit more detail and understand parliamentary sovereignty specifically. Parliamentary sovereignty has two major aspects, OK? Um, the first of these is that the courts must obey acts of Parliament in preference to any other kind of legal authority. So where Parliament says specifically and explicitly a certain thing, it is not for the courts to disregard that particular provision. There may be instances, and there are instances, where the courts may interpret provisions that are established by Parliament, and that is perfectly within the remit of the judiciary of the United Kingdom. They have the authority to interpret provisions because Parliament passes law that is sometimes very difficult to understand very difficult to interpret and so one of the interesting things is relating to that particular element i mean at the time of recording uh, my partner is actually somebody who is researching uh, terrorism legislation within the united kingdom and the way in which it has been treated by the courts and there is just the, the, the way in which terrorism legislation is interpreted uh, owes to the fact that the creation of this law is deliberately or arguably deliberately vague, very difficult to define and is trying to define an ethereal concept. So you have to rely on the courts in these regards to come up with some kind of uh, clear understanding of what the law actually means. But where the law is clear and where the courts may wish to disobey the acts of parliament that have been uh, that have been passed there is no legal authority for them to do so the second principle is this idea that nobody including parliament itself can place limits upon the freedom of action of a future parliament uh, written in a better way you would argue that parliament cannot bind its successors so one of the things that should be noted as a point of terminology within a level government and politics is the idea that where there is a new election and we have new MPs joining uh, Westminster, this is considered to be a new parliament. Parliament is the dissolved and then it is uh, brought back uh, following an election, for example. And so these are separate parliaments. This is what they describe as. And so a parliament that exists and is sitting right now cannot pass legislation that would bind a parliament that exists in the future. So you can't pass a law today that legally a future parliament could not reverse. Parliament can always reverse whatever legislation it so chooses. Now, there is some debate as to whether or not they have to be explicit in the in the uh, in the removing of certain specific kinds of legislation. And we'll get to that in a second when we look at the Thoburn and Sunderland City Council case. But in terms of just any old legislation, Parliament is always able to remove and replace uh, the older legislation with newer legislation. It doesn't even necessarily have to explicitly repeal the older legislation. This owes to the doctrine of implied repeal. The doctrine of implied repeal tells us that where a future parliament passes an act of parliament, passes a law, and that the wording of that legislation or the content of that legislation actually contradicts a previous law rather than having a debate about which of the two pieces of legislation actually applies in this particular circumstance the doctrine of implied repeal tells us that it will always be the case that the older legislation becomes subordinate 
and it becomes um, essentially repealed. And it is known as the doctrine of implied repeal because the idea here is that if Parliament is passing a piece of legislation in the future that essentially overturns the previous legislation, then what is implied is that they have repealed that legislation. Uh, they are implying that they are repealing the legislation without necessarily explicitly coming out and saying it. Now, one of the questions you might get asked in an A-level politics exam is whether or not Parliament still remains to be sovereign. Now, the definitive answer to this question, the definitive answer to this question in terms of the legal sovereignty that Parliament has is yes, it does absolutely remain sovereign. But there are attacks and there have been attacks on this idea of parliamentary sovereignty. So these are theoretical restrictions. So, for example... Let's think about the laws that were passed or and still do apply in some cases from the European Union. Laws from the European Union were binding onto the United Kingdom, and this was regardless of parliamentary sovereignty. Well, you might argue, well, doesn't that mean, therefore, that the law of the European Union, because it was directly effective onto the United Kingdom, as the United Kingdom used to be a member state of the European Union, does that mean that the Parliament was not sovereign? Because there was a there was a higher law, there was something that Parliament was subordinate to, the European Union. Well, the answer is no. And the reason why is because the European Union only had legal authority within the United Kingdom because of legislation that was passed by Parliament themselves. So in the 1970s, Parliament passed the European Communities Act, I believe it was 1972. And the European Communities Act gave effect to European Union law within the United Kingdom. So the European Union only had authority over the United Kingdom, and therefore they only had authority over Parliament themselves, because Parliament directly said that they could. So there is nothing in the law, there is nothing in the principle of parliamentary sovereignty that says that Parliament cannot uh, vote to make itself less sovereign, make itself subordinate to another authority, which is what the European Communities Act essentially did. But what is the key caveat here is, while this is de facto making Parliament less sovereign, in reality and, and, and in law, it's not doing so because it is only making itself less sovereign because of the legislation that is passed by Parliament itself. So Parliament is sovereign in its ability to make itself less sovereign, okay? And in any event, Parliament could just have easily uh, reversed this uh, in, in process anyway, which is essentially what happened with the Brexit referendum and the subsequent leaving of the European Union and the fact that Parliament had to have the authority in voting for Article, uh, Article 50 and leaving the European Union, which is, of course, what was decided in the first Supreme Court Miller case. The second idea is the idea that the Human Rights Act places restrictions on Parliament. I put in brackets again, but not really. The idea behind the Human Rights Act is that you can, as a court, issue what is known as a declaration of incompatibility. Essentially, whenever a new piece of legislation is passed, uh, within the second reading, I believe, it might, or even, uh, in fact, the first reading of the uh, legislation, uh, the bill is required by law to ensure that it is... Um, declared to be compatible with the Human Rights Act. Now, if a court by way of judicial review is looking at a piece of legislation and is being asked, well, whether or not this piece of legislation actually um, actually is compatible with the Human Rights Act and they believe it is not, then they can issue a declaration of incompatibility. Now, why is that a case of Parliament not being sovereign well on its face you might say well parliament is not being sovereign because the human rights act gives the courts the ability to strike down legislation but the courts aren't striking down legislation when they issue a declaration of incompatibility they are sending that legislation back to parliament for parliament to amend Ultimately, if Parliament wanted to reverse and repeal the Human Rights Act, which at the time of recording they haven't, um, the, I'm recording this on the 30th of June 2023, but in future they might repeal the Human Rights Act given the rhetoric of the Conservative government, 
they could just as easily do so. They could repeal the Human Rights Act and therefore Parliament is again in this example using legislation, using its own sovereignty to limit its own sovereignty. That's essentially what it's doing. But it's not binding successive parliaments because Parliament has the legal authority to, to revoke the Human Rights Act whenever it wants to, to issue a new Bill of Rights or to just get rid of it completely. And so the idea here is that what the obligation on the part of the Parliament is uh, is when there is a court that strikes down a piece of legislation is that of a political declaration the idea being here is that the declaration of incompatibility makes it very clear that lawfully the um, the 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 piece of legislation does not fit with the human rights act it is incompatible with the human rights act and the political mandate and the political will that is given is uh, is what makes Parliament want to change that legislation so that it is compatible with the Human Rights Act. Now, this has all been challenged slightly by the courts in the case of Thoburn and Sunderland City Council, which does ultimately give something of an attack on parliamentary sovereignty. Because what this case did was make it clear that there are some certain pieces of legislation that are said to be constitutional in nature. Now, what actually these pieces of legislation are is not necessarily clear, but we can all generally have consensus on some of them. So, for example, the Human Rights Act from 1998 is considered to be a constitutional piece of legislation. The Constitutional Reform Act, the uh, Early Bill of Rights, um, uh, some other, uh, the European Communities Act, the, the, the uh, exiting of the European Union legislation that we have, all of these different things are considered to be constitutional statutes. And then once it's done that, once it, the, the case made that delineation, they then went on to say that in order for Parliament to reverse constitutional statutes, they have to expressly repeal which essentially means that Parliament does not have the ability to reverse constitutional legislation through the doctrine of implied repeal. That's what this case essentially held. It's a relatively controversial case because what this is doing is actually limiting parliamentary sovereignty because one of the key aspects of parliamentary sovereignty is the idea of implied repeal. So what we have here is parliamentary sovereignty being somewhat reversed or somewhat limited in the sense that parliament could not just pass a piece of legislation that is incompatible with the human rights act and therefore impliedly repeal the human rights act in order for parliament to actually repeal the human rights act they have to be explicit by making it very clear we are repealing the human rights act and we are potentially replacing it or we're just going to leave it without we're going to leave the uk without any human rights that is the idea that is presented here in the case of Thoburn. Does this necessarily mean that we have an attack on parliamentary sovereignty? Or is it just saying that, well, parliament is still sovereign, they still have legal sovereignty completely, no other institution is um, parliament subordinate to, but it's just putting a bit of friction between the idea of parliamentary sovereignty and the constitutional statutes that they have passed. Potentially, that could be an argument that is made, because ultimately... So long as there is a majority in, in, in the House of Commons, they can still repeal and replace and do anything they want with any of the constitutional statutes that are cited in Thoburn and Sunderland City Council. They just have to be explicit in doing so. That's a little debate that can be had, and that is a debate that is had with constitutional lawyers. So... Another example of attack on parliamentary sovereignty is, of course, devolution. But just like with the European Communities Act and the Human Rights Act, devolution is something that essentially grants the assemblies and parliaments of the of the devolved bodies, like the Scottish Parliament and the, the Northern Ireland Assembly and the Welsh Assembly. They are granted that authority because of Westminster Statute, because of primary legislation, the Scotland Act, the Government of Wales Act, etc, etc, etc. So in a similar sense that Parliament is giving away power, they are only giving away power because they have voted themselves to give away power. They are using parliamentary sovereignty to restrict their sovereignty. The final thing you can talk about is the delineation between legal sovereignty and political sovereignty. Legally, Parliament is completely sovereign to make and unmake any law they so choose. But politically, they are accountable to the electorate. So a good example is Parliament could technically, legally, 
pass a piece of legislation that makes it perfectly legal for murder to be allowed. <laughs> it makes murder legal. Now, legally, there is no restriction on doing that. But politically, it would be a very unpopular idea. It would probably cause either a uh, the forcing of an election or more likely a revolution. And so the idea here is that Parliament is limited by the people in the sense that there is a political limitation on sovereignty. There is a distinction between law and politics and between political and legal sovereignty, such that legal sovereignty is much higher than political sovereignty. This was an idea that was presented by the constitutional jurist, the constitutional thinker, uh, A.V. Dicey.